prepare to uh, go before the Lord and uh, worship Him. So, Garrett, what can you bring up for us? So we have a, a list of the things that we normally do. I know it's a little small, but that's the conference. What I want to point out from this is the Women's Bible Study, Tuesdays, 1830. You can see uh, Miss Amani about that as a point of contact. The officer's Bible study continues on. Is 19 or 1930? It's 19? 1930. It's 1930, so we'll change that, make that adjustment to that. That's, um, you can see Cody or Jen, and uh, there's a rotation of houses there in Eagle, to, and uh, food is provided, so that's awesome. Next slide. Okay, so we uh, had our second Saturday with this, and I, 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 don't, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm enjoying myself. Um, but it's still available, so if you want to come and jump in on that, I have a book and workbook, and we're working our way through material, and uh, we're just honing in on how to understand the scriptures so that we don't end up with a wild, wacky, and weird understanding of things. And uh, we have uh, accomplished our first, and now we're doing our second on Tuesday. We had a nice dinner, and uh, I have been profiting from going through the workbook. I've made it part of my devotions. It's a, it's a, it really gets you thinking and meditating on who the Lord is, and you've got um, answers and fill in the blanks to give that I've just, maybe someone at some point can give their own testimony to it, but even for me, it just slows me down and just helps me to re-engage with who the Lord is, and it just has been blessing me. Next slide. So after the worship today, we'll mosey on over to the bowling alley, and we will eat and bowl. So you're very welcome to come. And do we have another slide in there, I think? No, we don't. Okay, we were going we were gonna to have one there that had to do with the interpretation. It was a little uh, humorous one, but we'll pull that one in at the end of the time, Austin had found something that was quite entertaining. So <laughs> we'll catch that one the next time. So those are our announcements. So there's, there's plenty of opportunity to, as believers, uh, sharpen your skills in the word, to grow in your knowledge of God Almighty, and, uh, and opportunities to fellowship and uh, continue to make connections and build relationship and have a sense of uh, family and community in Christ. So please avail yourself of those things. Amen. So we'll begin our service. Brother Cody. Good afternoon, everyone, and I'm glad to have you. I can personally attest that both those studies are awesome opportunities to really dive deeper and to learn more, more like in a group setting, more so than you can do um, by yourself. But, you know, with that, something I've been really thinking about this week is prayer. And a lot of times, you know, growing up, we, we just say a, a simple prayer, or I did growing up say a simple prayer growing up, but meditating this week in, over the course of reading a book, I was like, what is the importance of prayer? Why should we pray? And in the book that I read, Knowing and Doing the Will of God, it says prayer is an expression before God of one's faith, trust, and love for God and his people. And if we turn to James chapter 5, 16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So with, with that, prayer is important not just for ourselves, but for everyone around us, whether it be our spouse or friends. It, it definitely helps, and it's not just us asking for things from God. It's about us giving praise to God, for us to, you know, pray for other people. And it's really vital, and that, like, something that, you know, I've been really trying to do is, is pray more often, but also what I'm praying about and what I'm praying for, take note of that and kind of shift that to put more of an onus on God and not on myself. And with that, this comes to our prayer time where we just take the time to pray and confess our sins and ask for forgiveness of our sins and also give praise to God. So let's bow our heads and pray quietly to yourselves for a couple of seconds. God. 
God, we just come, first of all, to praise you for who you are and that you never change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, and we thank you for allowing us to come here to gather to worship you and to learn more about you, God. God, we just pray that you be with Chaplain Black as he brings the message. And God, we most importantly thank you for giving your son to die on the cross for our sins so that we may have eternal life. And I pray that if anyone doesn't know you and is not saved, that you can soften their hearts and draw them in during this time here. We pray for the rest of the base as they go about their days that it can be a lonely time here at Insulik, but there's so much and so great love, so much love available for them through you, God. We just pray for them that if they don't know you, that they do come to know you. God, we thank you and praise you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Our call to worship today comes from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 1 through 3. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as raindrops on the tender herb, and as showers on the grass, for I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. Thank you. If you'll stand with us to start worship. Stay. 
reading here from Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10. And after that, we will prepare for our offering. Hebrews chapter 10, we're reading verses 19 through 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. The writer says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. We'll have the ushers come forward and take up our offering. We're starting back to taking up the offering in person, so as they come forward, I'm going to ask the Lord's blessing on the giving. Father, 
we owe everything to you. Were it not for you, we would have nothing. But Lord, you've given us all that we have. You've blessed us with so many things, including, Lord, good employment and opportunity to have many things. And Father, we pray now that we would give back a portion of all that you've given us so that we can further the work of the chapel. Lord, to be able to provide and fund many things, activities that we do to increase the spiritual resiliency and the discipleship and the encouragement of our fellow airmen. And so, Father, we pray you would bless the offering now in Christ's name. Amen.
be to Christ indeed, who reigns above, sitting at the right hand of the Father, full of grace and truth, ready to intercede at any moment for his children as he hears us speaking to him. Please turn into 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel 25, as we continue to look at some character sketches out of the life of Israel at this time. We've looked at Samuel, we've looked at Saul, we've looked at David. Now we're going to look at a minor but yet important character, Abigail. Abigail. She plays a very important role here. The aim of this sermon is this, that we should be teachable because God uses others to fulfill his will in our life. Be teachable because God uses others to fulfill his will in our life. There's a lot of irony in this passage, uh, this chapter, and I'll, I'll bring some of that out to you. The larger context here, of course, David is on the run. He's supposed to be king. King Saul is holding on to the kingship, won't let go of it. He's got his 3,000 chosen men. He's after David. David has about 400 to 600 men that are faithful to him. David is running. We saw last Sunday in chapter 24 where David had the chance from the recesses of the cave to come forward and kill King Saul. And David's men were saying, do it, do it. But David cut off the corner of Saul's robe, then felt guilty for it, felt bad for it, and said, no, I shall not put my hand up against God's anointed. He is still the king. It would be wrong to kill him. That's in 24. Today we're in 25. Next chapter is 26. In 26, the same thing happens. David is able to come into the camp of Saul. They have bed down and bivouacked for the night. They're sleeping under the stars. David is able to come into the midst of them and actually take Saul's water bottle and his spear from him. He could have killed him. I'm sure that David and his men were tempted more than once to go ahead and just take Saul out. They could easily rationalize doing so. So between 24 and 26, you have on both, both chapters, David is restraining himself. David is following God's word. Not so in 25, the chapter in the middle. And this brings up an observation for us. We as people are inconsistent. We see inconsistency in David. 24, he restrains himself and doesn't kill Saul. 26, he restrains himself and doesn't kill Saul, even though Saul's trying to kill him. In 25, it's not the case. Even though we're inconsistent, praise God that he's merciful. God is merciful even when we are inconsistent, and we'll see that as well. So if you kind of put it really quickly, it would be like this. Problem, David and a man named Nabal, N-A-B-A-L. Nabal in the he Hebrew means fool. How would you like it if your mother had named you that? <laughs> hey, fool. Hey, I'm not a fool. No, that's your name. Oh, that's right, I forgot. The man's name means fool. And for whatever reason, we don't know, his parents named him that. So there's David and there's Nabal. And there's a problem between the two of them. Talk about the need for conflict resolution. We'll see that here, including the biblical principles of conflict resolution, which we all need. So there's the problem, but then there's an appraisal that Abigail makes. Abigail sees what's going on. She sees what David's doing. She sees what's happening with her husband, Nabal. And she makes an appraisal about what to do between the two of them. And then she has a solution. The solution is bring God down into the picture and use some principles to resolve this. So the setting here is that David is hungry, tired, hot and sweaty, stinky, and in need of a place to get clean and to eat because he's constantly on the run out in the elements, living in caves, walking through fields, under the heat of the sun, in the cold of the night, and his men are hungry. And as they're traveling through a particular territory, it happens to be they're traveling through areas that Nabal, who is a wealthy farmer, has his men and his shepherds out there grazing and just doing business. David's men, without anybody asking, traveling through the same areas where Nabal's uh, animals are, are eating and grazing, takes care of Nabal's animals and takes care of Nabal's shepherds, his employees, being subject in those days to any kind of bandits or thieves or marauders or whatever that 
will endanger when, when, when they're out, way out in the elements. David does this. And so David says to himself, well, we're just starving. We need something. There's a wealthy man, a fellow Israelite. We've been taking care of his property, his assets, his people. Let's, and so David takes a few, few of his men and says, go, greet him respectfully. Tell him, could you please spare a little something for us? They go, meet Nabal and his party, and Nabal basically says, no, I'm not giving you anything. And that's where I'd like for us to break in here to the chapter. Chapter 25, look with me at verse 9, 25-9. When David's young men came, they said all of this to Nabal in the name of David, and then they waited. Verse 10, and Nabal answered David's servants, quote, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shearers and give it to men who come from I do not know where? So David's men go back, report this to David, and David's answer comes in verse 13. And David said to his men, every man strap on his sword, and every man of them strapped on his sword. And so David also strapped on his sword, and about 400 of his men went with him. It was time to kill that man. David said, that's it, I've heard enough. How, how disrespectful. What a mistreatment. How upset I am that I'm being treated like this. Everybody, get your sword. We're going to go take care of this man right now. So that's what he does. He gets 400 of his men. He says, we're going to go, and we're going to do business with Nabal. We're going to just get rid of him. He is so angry. But Abigail intervenes. And like I said, the irony here, he's ready to kill someone when he shouldn't. But he didn't do that in the, first, in the chapter before, and he didn't do that in the chapter after. We can be inconsistent. We know that but God's mercy is great. And so Abigail makes three kinds of appeals, and I would like to bring those to you. And these are very practical. These are good for, us, for our life. It's good for our life at work, our life at home, our life with friends. Abigail makes three appeals. First, she appeals to the Lord when she intervenes. We see that in several verses. I just will skip through and look at some of them. So in verse 26, when she comes and meets David along the trail where he's on the warpath ready to kill her husband. She says in verse 26, now then my Lord, so uh, small l, she's talking to David, calling him essentially master, uh, you know, a term of respect to him. After all, he is the king heir. He's the king heir apparent. He's the king uh, in waiting. She said, now, now then my Lord, as capital L, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, vengeance, now then let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord be as Nabal, in other words, be as a fool. And we see in verse 28, please forgive the trespass of your servant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord. We see also in verse 29, she says that even though people seek his life, she says, don't, rem don't forget, your life is bound up in the bundle of the living in the care of the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies he shall sling out from the hollow of a sling. There's a piece of irony right there. Picture this. David is with his entourage. He's making his way to kill Nabal and Nabal's men. And as he's on his way, suddenly Abigail and her small entourage of people step in the way and block the path, essentially. And David has to come to a halt and say, what are you, who are you and what are you doing? And she begins to make appeals to him, to entreat him. And isn't it interesting that she brings up the word sling? Now, how many of you, when you think of David, think of sling? What do you think might be in David's mind when he hears her using these wor words about slings? What do you think? What's his mind going back to? Goliath? David and Goliath. David used his sling 
to kill Goliath. So David was trusting in God and letting God use him to carry out God's purposes with the use of the sling against God's enemies. And now she brings up the same word to him. Talk about irony. Can you imagine that? She's standing there talking to him. She says, and by the way, in the lives of your enemies, God will sling out as from a hollow, the hollow of a sling. And David's like, oh, sling, yes, I know about slings. Um, so what is she doing? She's reminding David through the talking about a sling. She's reminding David of his past, a past wherein he trusted God with the results of something big. And now here he is on his way to sin by killing Nabal. And she's reminding him of slings to get his attention. We see in verse 31, she also does the same thing. And when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your servant. So if you add, if you add all the times that God and Lord are used in this short section of about eight verses, including the use of he twice for God, ten times she references God in this brief conversation. What do you think this appeal is? She is appealing to the Lord for him and to him. I think that is so important because obviously David has temporarily, spiritually blinded himself from what the Lord would want him to do. And he's taking matters into his own hand. He's seeking vengeance. This is the David of the previous chapter who said, I will not take vengeance against God. This is the David who told Saul, God will sort this out. God will receive vengeance on my behalf. I will not raise my hand against you. And now here he is raising his sword to kill a man who has upset him. I'm not giving him what he feels entitled to. And Abigail has to come along and say, the Lord, what is the Lord saying to you, David? And so she is appealing to him by bringing the Lord into it. And that is so important. In your marriage, if you're married, in your relationships, in your family life, if you're parents, with friends, this is so important. And this is something I strive, my wife and I, we strive to do this with our two boys, is we're always bringing down the Lord into their situation. They might be at odds with each other. They might get into a, an argument, like my two boys. They might have a conflict with some other friend. They might even have some sort of a disagreement or conflict with us as their, as their parents. They, uh, they might come in the house with some, just something that's disappointing or upsetting to them, and they're tempted to do something they shouldn't do, or their reaction is not pleasing to the Lord. The first thing we want to do, my wife and I, is bring the Lord down into the picture. If we don't do that, then what we're really doing is we're raising our boys to say, God is good on Sunday, but the rest of the week is just human interactions and dealing with life in kind of a pragmatic way. However, we can use uh, psychology or something to solve our problems. Uh, you know, God is not really a part of this life. God is something we talk about on Sunday. No, no. We don't want that. As soon as a conflict arises... As soon as difficulties come, we want to bring God down into the picture because as believers, we want to know what God has to say in the problem. We want to know what God's solution is. We want our reactions to be influenced by the presence, the power, and the principles of the Lord. And that's what she does. David's not thinking about God. Who is David thinking about right now? David. He's thinking about himself. And maybe he's thinking about his men. He's like, these guys are following me. They're making such great sacrifice. And they've been turned down by uh, something so simple as food from a wealthy man. Oh, I'm tired of this treatment. I am going to put on my sword and we are going to go. And we're going to get what we want to get. And we're going to take care of that fool. And then Abigail says, stop. Remember the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Ten times in David's face. She gets, up on, she gets up in his grill ten times with the Lord. And you see, that has an appeal to him 
because he is a believer and he has been following the Lord, however imperfectly, but he has been following the Lord all the days of his life. The second appeal is to God's comprehensive care. We see this. Look at the way she speaks to him. Look in verse 26 again. As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand or delivering yourself by your own vengeance, essentially. She's appealing. She's saying, listen, both now and in the past, God has restrained you. God has restrained you from killing Saul when you had the chance. God has restrained you from taking vengeance. And even now, by me standing here entreating you, God is bringing a restraint on you. God has, is caring for you even now, David. We see in verse 30, And when the Lord has done, done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you, and has appointed you prince over Israel. So, then we see the way she speaks in verse 28. Please forgive the trespass of your servant, for the Lord will certainly, will certainly make my Lord a sure house. Because the Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord. And in verse 31, and when the Lord has dealt well with you, remember me. Notice that she is talking in the past, in the present, and in the future. She's saying the Lord has taken care of you. He has restrained you. He has set you up to be the prince, the king. Now he is preserving you, restraining you, and he's doing you good. And in the future, God has set a sure house for you. He has a purpose for you in your future. So David is being hit with this very comprehensive appeal. David, David, God has always been good to you. He is good to you now. And he also has good for your future. Why are you going to ruin that? By killing my husband unfairly, illegally, immorally? Don't do this. And so you see her appeal is comprehensive. And it's true. Whenever we get into situations where we are in an argument or in a disagreement or in a conflict, again, whether it be in our home, in private life, whether it be at work, whether it be with our friends, and we are tempted to do something we shouldn't do, say something we shouldn't say, or go about it in a way that is absent of God's ways and will, and somebody says, God has taken care of you all your life, right? Well, yes. And God has taken care of you now, right? Yes. And God has a beautiful plan for your future, a purpose, right? Yes. So why would you want to do this and jeopardize and ruin these things? It helps to bring us down. Bring us down more to say, that's true. There's, there's, there, it, why would I want to mess with that good God and his plan for my life. And it helps him. And the third appeal we see is to conscience. And we see that in verse 31. She uses the word. She says, my Lord, meaning David, shall have no cause of grief or pangs or pains of conscience for having shed blood without cause or for my Lord working salvation for himself and delivering himself. She appeals to his conscience. God has given us all a conscience, that little voice, those feelings we get when we say that's wrong, that's not good. And she says, David, you will regret the day that you go and kill my husband and all his men. David, you're going to grieve for the rest of your life. It's going to hang on you. Your conscience is going to stick you and poke you for the rest of your life. You're going to regret this, that you ever did this. David, don't do this. And so you can see she appeals, she brings the Lord down in to his life and puts the Lord right in his face. She appeals to the fact that God, God is going to work this out. God has, is, and will care for him, has good plans for him, is going to make him prince, has a purpose, build him a sure house, meaning his kingdom, 
all of this. She's holding all that out in front of him, saying, David, do you want to ruin that or jeopardize that? And then he appealed to conscience. You don't want to do this, David. This is going to be something that you'll be grieved about and it will bother you. And there we have it. These three appeals. Now, one of the obvious questions for him and for us would be, what, what could have, what could David have done as a reaction? He, right? Because, I mean, he very rashly said, that's it, every man strap on his sword. I mean, he quickly reacts when he hears the way he and his men are being treated by Nabal. He gets angry. He's getting vengeful. He's indignant. Maybe he feels entitled. Like, I, am the, I am the prince that's going to be taking over. I am the king just waiting. I am the, the most successful general that Israel has had in battle, defeating the Philistines and other enemies. People sing songs about me. Right? Does this, does this fool know who he's talking to when he rejects me and my men? After all, we have been taking care of his property, his animals, and his men, watching over them. Oh, I can imagine how indignant David was, how upset he was. Well, to the point where he says, I, that's it. Get your swords, men. We're going to go take care of this guy. But then in steps this woman, Abigail. He doesn't know her, but in she steps, blocks his path and starts making these appeals. What could David have said? Listen, none ya. Right? None ya. None of your business. Lady, sorry, get out of the way. This is really none of your business. This is between me and your husband. Your husband has done me wrong, and he's going to pay now. He could have said that. He could have said something like, well, I don't really listen to women. Right? I just, sorry, this is man to man. This is uh, one leader uh, versus another, and you know what? I just don't want to have to hear from you, so please step aside. He could, have, he could have done something else, which you know affects even us in the military when it comes to, to status and rank and stuff. He, he could have said, well, uh, your status is not where mine is. You know, I am David. I've been appointed by the Lord himself. <laughs> I'm basically the king almost. And you're just this average woman out uh, with a wealthy husband on a farm. I'm sorry. I'm not, I don't have to listen to you. You see what I'm saying? This is the answers that David could have given easily. These might be the kind of things that we might tend to say. If someone comes to intervene in our life, we're about to do something out of emotion we shouldn't do. Somebody steps in and we're sometimes in our pride, we, well, who are you? It's none of your business. Do you think you have a place to speak to me? Right? As Christians, we cannot be like that. Be teachable, because God can use anyone, no matter whether it's a man or a woman, whether they're a lower status or a higher status, doesn't matter. God can use anyone to speak to us to help us out. But praise God, you know, we're thankful in many ways. I mean, when it comes to, like, none of your business and this kind of thing, I mean, are we glad, for example, that, I, well, how would you like it if Abraham Lincoln back in 1861 had said, you know what, whatsoever, whatever is going on in the South, it's not my business. It's not my business. I just want to run a nice White House uh, for four years. I may get elected again. I may not, but I'm, you know, it's not really my, that's their thing. They're just, you know, leave that alone, and I won't bother. Would we all go, yeah, that's right. Stay in your lane. Stay in your business. No, we're glad that didn't happen. Or you fast forward to the 1950s and 60s. What would it have been like if, if MLK would have said, well, you know what, as long as I am personally okay and happy, it's really none of my business to get into the affairs of other people and what's going on in our nation. Uh, it's not my business. You see, we're glad. We're glad when we see people who don't take this line of, well, it's none of my business. The problem is our pride. When it comes to someone speaking into our life, that's when we start getting defensive and saying, well, I don't think that's really your business. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't mean that we should go around sticking ourselves into every little thing that everybody's in. That's not what I'm saying. And we don't have time to go into a lot of detail to break all that out. But I, I hope you're getting my general understanding here. Is that David is confronted, and she said, listen, 
I'm here to appeal to you not to do this. And, and David does not, as a, as a believer, David does not have the right to say, this is none of your business, just move aside. Oh no, it is her business. And it's the business of every Christian to be ready to help another Christian or to intervene when a fellow brother or sister is starting to head down the wrong path. I could think of, I could think here in James, a very important principle, right, from James chapter 1. You know, I use this for myself. I, I have to use this to teach my boys. Um, James 1, 19 and 20. Know this, my beloved brother, brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. David was being quick to anger rather than slow to anger. And David's anger, as it says in James, was not going to produce the righteousness of God. It was going to produce the unrighteousness of a sinful action. But this is what happens when we allow ourselves to lose control. So, for example, we find in in the Proverbs some very important wisdom So, for example, Proverbs 25, verse 28. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. A person who loses their self-control is likened to a city that's broken into and left without walls. Back in the ancient times when a city did not have walls around it, what was the problem there? They were vulnerable, vulnerable to attack, right? The attack of our own sinful desires, the attack of Satan and his arrows he's always slinging at us. And that's what happened to David. He made himself open to attack inside his heart. He allowed himself. And so as he, there he was on the precipice, he's on the edge of losing self-control, grabs his sword, tells his men to grab their swords, on his way to kill this guy, this fool. He's lost control. And by losing that control, as the proverb says, you're like a city with no walls. You're vulnerable. Vulnerable even to your own desires. But God, in his mercy, sends Abigail to catch him before it's too late. We see in Psalm 29, 11, another very important and powerful verse to have in our arsenal. A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. Here's another irony. Nabal means fool, right? And the Bible says there in Proverbs 29, 11, it's the fool who gives a full and open venting of his spirit, of his emotions, but a wise man will quietly hold it back. David's given full vent to his emotion, which makes him a fool, and he's a fool going after another fool. And sometimes that happens to us. We end up being the foolish one, thinking we are doing something to someone who we think is a fool, and we end up almost in the same boat as them. And David here is doing the same thing. He's making himself a fool. He's not controlling himself. And so God intervenes through Abigail in these three ways of appealing to him to help him gain self-control again. And pride, right? Pride always precedes a fall. David is right there about to fall off the cliff. It's as if David is, 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 is uh, almost losing balance and going headlong to make this fateful decision, this terrible decision to, to, to kill a man in blood guilt. He's almost about ready to do that, and it's as if Abigail grabs him by the back of his cloak and pulls him away from the edge. But it, it was Abigail, but not really Abigail. It was the Lord using Abigail because God uses other people to fulfill his will in our lives. Let us be teachable. And so she intercedes, and there's some other things that here I'll mention quickly. You notice in verse 28, she actually asks for forgiveness, not because she's done something wrong, but because she's interceding for her husband. 
She's saying, I am here on behalf of my foolish husband, Nabal. I don't blame you, David. I am here on behalf of him. Forgive the trespass of my husband. Who do we know that also had done no wrong, but came to intercede and ask for forgiveness for someone else's sin? It's Jesus Christ, of course. There's a, there's a picture here of Jesus Christ. Christ, who knew no sin, became sin for us, so that in him we might have the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 tells us that. And so she does. She intercedes and asks for forgiveness. She acknowledges his feelings. It doesn't mean she agrees with him, but she acknowledges. And that's another thing that helps us to resolve conflict, is we acknowledge, listen, I know, I understand what you're going through and how you're feeling. That also helps to bring David down from his high emotions. And she does that with him too. And she pays respect. We see in, in verse 23, she dismounts from her animal and she says she hurried and got down from the donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. Another irony. When David watches King Saul in the previous chapter go out of the cave and start walking back to his soldiers, David comes to the mouth of the cave and says, King Saul! King Saul turns around. And the Bible says there in, in that chapter, chapter 24, verse 8, it says David bowed in respect to King Saul. Another irony. Here David is bowing to the man who's trying to murder him. Now David is trying to murder another man, and that man's wife bows to him to show him respect. Thereby, another element of how to diffuse conflict. Make sure you're showing the person respect, even though you think they might be wrong, even though they may have done you wrong. Showing them respect. She does these things. Because she's doing the will of God. And whenever you're doing the will of God, you're doing the work of God. And it was God's work here to prevent David from doing this. Be teachable. God uses others to work in our lives. And we see the three kinds of appeal. Appeal to the Lord. So when you're in conflict, appeal to the Lord. Bring him down. Bring his word into your situation. Recall that God is taking care of you before. He's in your life right now. And he has a purpose and future for you after this happens. That also helps us. And then remember your conscience. Do you want to do or say anything that your conscience will then bother you afterwards for doing? These appeals that she makes brings this blessed end. And we are finished. Let's read verse 32 to finish out. Look at what all of this effect is on David. Verse 32. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you. You have kept me this day from blood guilt and from working salvation with my own hand. For as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, who has restrained me from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me truly by morning, there had not been left to Nabal so much as one male, one man. Wow. The mercy of God, even though we're inconsistent. David gets it. He receives the message. He takes the intervention. What Abigail did got through by God's grace to him. And so the man who was steaming mad, with steam coming out of his ears, with his sword in his hand, ready to strike, his men all jacked up and ready to strike with him and kill Nabal and all of his men, because David said, if it weren't for you, I'd have killed everyone. All the men would be dead, including your husband. He was all that. Then he gets appealed to the way he does by Abigail. And then he ends up totally changing. He drops all the pride. He drops the indignity. And he says, 
blessed be you and blessed be God. I'm being stopped here. I am teachable. And that's not a, a bragging thing. That's what he's basically saying. You have let, God has caused you to come and I have been teachable. And right now, blessed be you, Abigail, because God is using you to fulfill his will in my life. Oh, how we need that in our day and age and how we need that in our own lives. May God enrich us and seal this truth into our lives. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we thank you for how practical and applicable your word is to our life thousands of years after the fact because your principles are eternal and they endure to all generations. Father God, we thank you for your mercies that even at times when we are about just about like David, we pray, Lord God, you'd help us to control ourselves and turn to you and bring you into our lives and consult our conscience and remember just how you care for us. And Father, may that cause us to take a different course and make a different decision, one that honors you and leave to you the things we cannot control. Father, we thank you for this. And we thank you for Christ who opens our eyes to see it. And it's in his name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet and sing our song as we go out. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make me. This is what I pray. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, God bless you all. And again, you're all welcome to come with us over there to do some bowling and to eat together. Otherwise, uh, if you're heading out, then God bless you and I pray you have a, a strong week in the Lord. Amen. We are dismissed. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, oh God. No, <laughs> no more key changes. For